Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce today's first keynote speaker. Sir Simon Macdonald is a senior British diplomat who, uh, as he earlier reminded me, first entered the uh, FCO some 35 years ago. He is permanent undersecretary at the FCO and head of the diplomatic service. Among numerous key roles, uh, Simon was ambassador to Germany for five years, uh, ambassador to Israel for three years, and foreign, foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Gordon Brown. He is one of the government's leading voices on the Middle East, Europe and transatlantic relations. Please welcome Sir Simon Macdonald. <laughs> My lords, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you, Richard, for that introduction. Uh, a very handsome introduction, uh, but I have to say, not the best I have ever had. Um, that would be in Tel Aviv at an event a dozen years ago, where the introducer got a little bit flustered and ended by introducing me as His Majesty Simon McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but thank you, too, to Bicom and Jewish News for arranging this event. I am glad to be with you 100 years since Arthur Balfour, as Foreign Secretary, crafted the 67-word Balfour Declaration in a letter to Lord Rothschild. As he wrote, at a desk now in the Museum of Jewish Diaspora in Tel Aviv, he wanted his words to have historic effect. <coughs> His Majesty's Government broke new policy ground by declaring British support for a national home for the Jewish people. Given that both the writer and recipient were members of Parliament, it is apt that we proudly mark the centenary of the declaration in the Houses of Parliament today. As the first keynote speaker in a full day of discussion, I know one thing for sure, that you'll hear the points I make for the first time today. Uh, and I owe one thing to subsequent speakers, not to make all the points that can be made. So I shall restrict myself to some history, uh, some reflections about UK-Israel relations today, and to some observations about the second part of the Balfour Declaration which remains unfulfilled business. I am a historian by training, and I have Middle East experience in Saudi Arabia to add to my time as British ambassador to Israel. So I know that it is a region where analyzing trends is not without controversy. This is true whether discussing the Balfour Declaration, Lawrence of Arabia, or even where to get the best hummus. As an example, consider the man after whom the room we are in right now is named, the Attlee Room in Portcullis House. Clement Attlee is one of Britain's greatest prime ministers, but his international record is more disputed than his domestic legacy. He was in office at the end of the British Mandate of Palestine and during the Israeli War of Independence. His partial fulfillment of Balfour's promise 30 years earlier remains controversial. When trying to make sense of the present, we cannot ignore these controversies of the past. And we cannot ignore the negative feeling from Palestinians and the Arab world about the Balfour Declaration that still persists today. Despite these difficulties, it is clear that the Balfour Declaration was a pivotal moment in the long process which preceded the founding of the State of Israel. And the British government remains proud of the role the Balfour Declaration played in helping to make a Jewish homeland a reality. From a historian's perspective, I am also interested in testing the extent that the declaration was the decisive moment that led to the creation of the State of Israel. When <coughs> analyzing the place of the Balfour Declaration in history, people will discuss the historical, political, military, diplomatic, or moral forces that motivated Balfour and the War Cabinet in 1917. 
and argue that the declaration led to David Ben-Gurion's declaration of independence on the 14th of May 1948 and the creation of the State of Israel. But how critical was the Balfour Declaration? I have to confess that my permanent undersecretary predecessor, but 23, Lord Harding of Penshurst, opposed the Balfour Declaration. According to British diplomatic historian B.C. Bush, Harding did not press his opposition. I'll leave you to ponder whether an official's opposition ever changes government policy. Harding's opposition was not, however, to the substance. He was sympathetic to Zionist goals, but he distrusted general pledges. He wrote he had concerns about giving encouragement to a movement based on conditions which we cannot enforce. And he was right. <laughs> Because in the end, the Balfour Declaration was important, but it was the hopes, energy, determination, and ingenuity of Jewish immigrants to mandate Palestine in the third, fourth, and fifth Aliyah, as well as the hundreds of thousands of Holocaust survivors that led to the creation of the State of Israel 31 years after the Balfour Declaration. I would argue, therefore, that the declaration was a key moment along the way, and the UK is proud to have played our part. But it was the people on the ground who played the most decisive role in creating the successful, innovative, and prosperous country Israel is today. <coughs> that brings me to my second point about the UK-Israel relationship. The Balfour Declaration set the tone for the future relationship between the UK and Israel. I note that Balfour Street in hip central Tel Aviv intersects both Allenby Street and Rothschild Boulevard. I note too that the Israeli Prime Minister's residence is on Balfour Street in Jerusalem. The UK is a close friend of Israel and the UK has an unshakable commitment to Israel's right to exist and its security. We enjoy an excellent bilateral relationship. As a former ambassador, I know how it is a complex, sometimes difficult, always fascinating, and occasionally historically laden relationship. The relationship has been built on decades of cooperation across science, tech, cyber, education, business, arts, and culture. Our trade relationship is at a record high, $7.2 billion in 2016, and the UK is the second largest market for Israeli exports after the United States. Alistair Burt, Minister for the Middle East, attended the arrival ceremony in August for El Al's first Dreamliner aircraft, which was built following a one billion pound deal with Rolls-Royce to supply engines for all El Al's Dreamliners, including on the London to Tel Aviv route. Prime Minister Netanyahu is in London today for a guest of government visit to meet Prime Minister May and the Foreign Secretary. Such visits and the work of organisations like BICOM, one of our hosts today, help further strengthen our bilateral ties. As we work on advancing the UK-Israel relationship, it is important that we also work to fulfill all parts of the declaration. The second half of Balfour's declaration remains unfinished business. Earlier this week in the House of Commons, uh, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson said that the declaration's protasis, first clause, had been more fulfilled than its apodosis, saving clause. This second element said that the British government clearly understood <coughs> that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. If written after the Second World War, when the international community developed the rules-based international architecture, the declaration would have also referred 
to the political rights and rights to self-determination of these communities too. The Development Secretary, Priti Patel, will be speaking to you later today to describe the UK's support for Palestinian state-building efforts and our support for all efforts towards a negotiated settlement between Israelis and Palestinians. So while we are proud of our role in helping to make a Jewish homeland a reality and fully support the modern state of Israel as a Jewish homeland, the UK wants to see a lasting peace that fulfills the aspiration of the whole Balfour Declaration, a just and lasting resolution that ends occupation of the Palestinian territories and delivers security and peace for both Israelis and Palestinians. We believe the best way to achieve this is through a two-state solution based on the 1967 borders with agreed land swaps. <laughs> A two-state solution was first proposed by the Peel Commission in 1937 in an attempt to make a reality of both elements of the Balfour Declaration. The UK remains committed to this aim, and the UK is ready to do all it can to support this goal of a viable and sovereign Palestinian state alongside a secure Israeli state. I will conclude with a quotation about Balfour from his niece's biography. She wrote that her uncle said that what he had been able to do for the Jews had been the thing he looked back upon as the most worth his doing. I think he would be entitled to hold that view even more strongly <coughs> if he had lived to see what happened next. Our relationship with the State of Israel with the state he helped to found, goes from strength to strength, building on the historic document which he signed exactly 100 years ago today. Thank you very much. <laughs>